All right, let's talk about concrete construction overview, the basics. So I want to make sure you guys understand when I talk about construction practices. Um, you know, there's a lot of basic methodology about how you should can, could build in any construction in general. Um, concrete construction is no different. Where, you know, the specifications of the job, the, the contractor's equipment on hand, and really the pr uh, personal preference of that contractor are going to really show what methodology and construction practices that they're going to use. So in other words, if I line up myself and three other uh, con contractors that are, you know, concrete finishers, and we say, here's a job that we're going to do, maybe it's a floor slab. We may have different equipment to, to do everything. We may have a little different techniques, but at the end of the day, we still meet specifications. We're still, you know, we still did everything right. There are a lot of wrong construction practices that are out there that people do. However, uh, you know, I will communicate those and, and kind of show you things that you're not supposed to do and kind of gravitate and describe things that you are supposed to do. So that's kind of what the next five or six lectures will kind of be about. All right, so whenever you first start and get the bid, um, you put your bid in and you get a notification that, hey, you won the bid. We have a pre-construction meeting to talk about um, kind of like a project kickoff. This is an extremely important meeting. It provides you with, with great, you know, lines of communication where you get to see all the players that will be on this project, whether it's the plumber, the electrician, the superintendent, um, project, you know, the, the project manager, meet owners. There's lots of different subcontractors you may meet on this project. Um, you may, you know, they may have just have separate meetings for everybody where they just want the people that are all really focused on the concrete. Um, they may just have a meeting with them. They may just have just a single meeting with the concrete contractor. However, however the meeting is, um, it's something that you really need to, to focus on. It could be in a conference room. It can be in a, you know, back of a concrete truck. To me, it, 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 it really just, you need it, you know, somewhere. And just to start talking, open up those lines of communication, start talking about your estimating your start times and, you know, completing times and basic expectations. Because sometimes people say, hey, we need this job completed and within this amount of time frame, um, you have it, you know, this job completed on this day. And sometimes that, that just isn't going to happen. So it's better to kind of see some of the expectations now before you start the project because sometimes you may, you know, they may want to go with somebody else because really you, you won't be able to make it. Um, you can also talk about, you know, basic, basic potential issues that you're going to have. Um, you really need to talk about that. If there's some issues that, that are may going to come up on the project, you really need to talk about those. And I would highly suggest everybody that goes to that meeting has a checklist things that you're going to talk about. So there's some, you know, this is a pre-construction meeting checklist that, that I wrote um, for a book I have that kind of just, you know, the first page is about, you know, what is a construction pre-construction meeting? And then the other one is, is, you know, kind of the basic checklist and these checklists I've seen some from uh, the, I guess the American concrete contractors society, they have one that's, I don't know if it's 15 pages or whatever. It's a it's really good, very in-depth. Um, you can also have something that's very basic, like the one over on, on the right that I have, where you just have everybody's, you know, name and, and numbers and kind of, you know, basic background about the project. Maybe you're going to highlight some unique features. Talk about the milestones um, that you have for the project, what, you know, how you're going to get to those milestones equipment you're going to use. You may want to talk about how you're getting paid on the project. You may make sure, you know, you understand there's no issues with, you know, is it you get paid on a milestone, you get paid when the project's completed, uh, who you're getting paid is the, 
contractor going to pay everybody or is the owner going to pay each subcontractor? I mean, how's all, all going to work? All those things need to be, you know, you need to have down and you need to really look at the contract and the drawings and make sure you don't have any questions about the work before you start completing it. It's extremely important that you don't have any, have any, uh, if you have any questions, you get them addressed now and not whenever you spend a bunch of money on a project already. So one of the very first steps, uh, once you get your drawings and you do some, you know, you already have the surveying hopefully done, you may go out and you start doing your dirt work. Um, basics of the dirt work is you're going to remove that vegetation. You're going to remove any excess. You, you know, going to uh, if you have bad dirt, you're going to remove the bad dirt. Um, you're going to then go and do your basic. You know, you're going to grade out the the dirt, making sure that you don't have any. You know, any places that you know need you filled in, you fill it in. Any places that need to get cut, you, you cut those, you remove that excess. Um, and then you go back and you start compacting it. You know, maybe you have a sheep's foot or a roller compactor like you see there. Um, lots of different ways. If you have really bad soil, you may want to go in and do a partial depth reclamation where you just tear out that soil or a full depth where you just tear out, you know, uh, quite a bit of it. You may come in with, with fly ash or cement and, you know, to, to kind of treat that base to make it nice and hard, especially in Oklahoma, we have a lot of expansive clays. So you really want to make sure that you don't have any problems. And one thing I should say before you start really doing a lot of dirt work is you want to always, always, always get your lines marked. So utility companies, um, they will pay, like in our state is Oki One. Um, they have a, uh, a, in essence, a um, company, I guess is the right word. They have, they have a, uh, usually a lot of times they're nonprofit. Uh, it's a company that will come in and mark all the lines for you throughout the entire length of the project. They will, you know, they will come out every so often and mark those lines and make sure that you're not going to hit them. So every utility company pays a little money in and every state has their own utilities, um, you know, type company that, that, that for marking. And so a lot of times, you know, you don't want to go and dig in like over on the right. I had, I dug in with an auger and you're drilling down and all of a sudden you hit something solid. Obviously you want to stop digging you want to check to figure out what you hit that was solid. Um, the other picture that's in the middle, I think that's a water line that um, I was digging and, you know, with a, with an excavator and that bucket, I was digging it up and all of a sudden I saw some lines. I got real lucky. I didn't, you know, I get I didn't break any lines, but um, you know, those weren't marked. Neither one of those pictures you see there, they weren't marked. And so it's really easy to break the line. You don't want to break, fi especially fiber optics. You don't want to, you know, that can, you know, if you don't have the right insurance, you can pretty much go out of business pretty quickly as a construction company by, by hitting, you know, uh, fiber optics. You don't really want to take people's water or electric and, you know, and sewage and stuff. I mean, you really don't want to, mess with, you know, you really don't want to hit any lines. And so it's sad when, whenever you do, um, you know, so make sure you go out and you call OK one so you don't have those problems. We talk about form work. There's a lot of different uh, configurations we can talk about and different types of form work. Um, in essence, usually like if this is a basic for a floor slab, um, it's on the ground. It's real common to have concrete pressure that you calculate to make sure you don't have any, uh, um, you know, when the concrete gets poured, you're going to have some type of pressure, kind of like a retaining wall. So you need to make sure that your um, bracing, always call it a st your vertical stake, and then the um, the kicker, the bracing that's that's there make sure that it's going to be strong enough to hold that, not only that concrete pressure, but you may have some uh, moment 
that is created from your live load. Maybe it's from somebody's foot that's hitting the top of that form as they're dragging the concrete, or maybe there's a machine on top, something that, you know, there, there's always some type of moment that's there. So just kind of be aware of that, um, that there could be something there. So as, as things get taller, you're gonna get stronger and stronger moments um, and things need to be accounted for. So um, just kind of be aware of that. I won't go too much into form work um, right now when we go through the example problems. I'll have, I'll talk a lot more about form work. So still reinforcement, um, whenever you want to want to provide more strength for torsion or flexural or shear, you're going to have still reinforcement or what we call rebar. You can also have rebar, especially if you see rebar that's on like three foot centers, meaning the spacing of that, of that rebar is every three foot. Well, a lot of that spacing might be to temperature stresses or drying shrinkage cracking. So concrete, whenever, you know, the earth, whenever uh, it goes through heating and cooling cycles, um, you're going to have temperature changes. You're also going to have drying shrinkage changes where the concrete's going to lose moisture over time. And so that can change the volume of the concrete, both of the temperature and the drying shrinkage. So if you have reinforcement, that, that can kind of provide more tensile strength so that you don't have as much cracking. So reinforcement's going to be designed specifically for not only drying shrinkage and temperature stresses, but things like torsion and flexural and, and shear. Um, and so, you know, also, you know, so the, the spacing, the bends and the lap of those reinforcement are all, are all there. You kind of look at most grades. So the bottom right has different grades, um, kind of indicates on the different lines here. So usually most people use 60 grade um, for, for still is real common. Every once in a while, I'll see people, especially for residential work, they may use 40 grade. It's not as common, but um, you know, I will see 75 on, on some pretty uh, high strength type structures. So, <clears throat> and then you kind of right there at the, at the end, if you wanna go and check to make sure you have the right rebar, right reinforcement, you can actually right there on the reinforcement that mill will provide the, you know, the, the production of the mill, what the number, what their actual label is. And then they'll have the, the bar size, the type of metal that it is. And then um, there'll either be a mark for, you know, the grade, so 60 grade still, or the lines, like I just already talked about down here. Um, will be um, the different lines will be there. So this is obviously 40 grade on the right. And this right here is a 60 grade because of the lines in the number. So we talk about the on-site fabrication. Again, these bundles usually show up in, you know, 20 foot long sections or 40 foot or 30 foot long sections, sometimes 30 foot, usually if 20 and you can go and break the bundle, um, the bundles of the rebar, and you can start laying out the sections if you need to. A lot of times you'll take a quick saw, like you see up here in the middle picture, that will actually cut the re reinforcement. Make sure you wear safety glasses and other safety protection equipment whenever you are cutting reinforce, you know, cutting steel, because um, you know embers go everywhere. You can also tie the reinforcement together, like you see over here on the right. There is a picture of, of a joint um, for a floor slab that's on ground, and they tied the, the reinforcement together. There's actually different types of tie of tying um, reinforcement together. You can have a pair of pliers and a uh, and you think of it as like bell and wire, so a um, a roll of wire, and you can tie. Almost, almost anything together. There's also wire if you're doing a lot of like say floor slabs 
where you're just tying nodes, you may come in with little tie wire um, that have little loops on the end, like you see here with this picture on the right. There's these little loops, and you may have that little twister, and you'll tie those loops together. Um, you can also use a machine um, to, to tie the rebar together, too. And then you see that little chair over there, that little plastic gray, dark gray chair. Um, we'll lift that rebar up so it's not right there on the ground, but it's where it needs it in the project specifications. We can also talk about the shop fabrication of the rebar. So especially if you have a lot of cuts or bends and, and ties, you, wanna, you may want to go in and, and actually have the shop do it. So if you have a bunch of stirrups, normally sh the stirrups are done in the shop and bent to uh, the specifications of the drawing. You may have fabrication of like, say like for a column, you may have it done in a shop and both are brought out to the job site already pre-bent and cut properly. That's what a side view of, of, of rebar looks like. You can see little bunny, bunny uh, ears there for the, tw the twister that went in there and it tied it up kind of like you think of as a uh, bread, loaf of bread. You also talk about splices, rebar splices or lap or how much lap the rebar has. Um, you know, a lot of times they're 25, they're lapped 25 um, times the diameter of the rebar. So, um, you know, so that's, that's pretty common, but um, you can also do a development link calculation to figure that out. And that design engineer will actually have all that. We talk about reinforcement tolerances. Again, you know, the tolerances are gonna depend on the size of the concrete element, the, des the actual design, the dimensions, the construction process. Um, they're usually stated within your specifications. ACI um, 117 also has tolerances, also spacing tolerances. So a lot of times on a, uh, if this is a floor slab, three foot by three foot section, you may have a, a tolerance of, of three inches plus or minus, which is quite a bit, but um, you know, but it's sometimes you can have quite a bit of uh, um, you know play in, in in your tolerances and it still be just fine. We talked a little bit in the past about ordering concrete uh, in our in a previous lecture. Um, if you're a contractor, what I want to communicate is. Make sure you estimate your volume. You overestimate how much you're going to use, so how much you're going to actually fill in to that um, into your forms. Make sure you you know understand. I don't know how many people haven't really read ASTM C94, the standard specifications for ready-mix concrete. That may help you out drastically to understand what exactly is required whenever you're ordering and testing and batching concrete. So it could really open up your eyes as a contractor and help you in the future. So please, please, please read that standard so you understand it better. So the parameters that's discussed, the concrete code such as ACI, um, you know, if you're going to do DOT job, transportation job, you know, make sure you kind of communicate the concrete codes whenever you're ordering the concrete. Um, talk about different stuff in there that's in the specifications and the performance requirements. What equipment you're going to use? Is it going to be a pump truck or is it going to be a chute fed? That you know, that's kind of important. The actual work area that you're going to have to pour the concrete and um, you know, just the what 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 performance specifications are you required? You know, not only is it just workability and strength, but you know, you need air in the concrete for durability, stuff like that. So this is an example problem I kind of talked about in the past. We're going to have a safety factor. Some people have it three to 10 percent, five to 10 percent, something like that. It's, you know, you're always going to overestimate how much volume of concrete you're going to have because of waste and spillage and over excavation. I've even done it up to 20 percent sometimes because of just how bad the how bad um, the excavation and the dirt work was 
just didn't do a very good job. I didn't do the dirt work, but it was just a hard area. And so I need, I know I needed to over, uh, overestimate it. But when you do, you never estimate exactly right at um, the volume you need. You always estimate over that amount. So we talk about placement times. So when you need the concrete trucks there, you have you know five concrete trucks, you need them spaced every 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, every hour. I mean, and a lot of that just depends on the equipment, the labors and finishers you have, what application you know you're you're doing. Um, if you're pouring it in one big foundation, that's going to be different than, you know, if you're doing a lot of uh, four inch, you know, flat work, um, you know, you're going to have different uh, square, square footage areas. So um, just kind of be a realize that, you know, you may have some setting time issues if you don't have your replacement of your trucks right. You don't ever want to line up a bunch of trucks where it's just, you know, they're, where they're just backed up everywhere. Because um, at least these take at least 10 minutes a piece plus whatever travel time. So, you know, you're looking at this truck here, maybe may have been already been waiting 45 minutes and that's going to be, you know, and all these other trucks, you keep adding them up and it's like, well, for too long, you know, this truck here's uh, needs to be rejected because it's over been over an hour and a half. Like ASTM C39 states. So again, I want to understand when you're ordering concrete, understand your environment. Um, you know, what type of year is it? What's the wind look like? What's the, the humidity and the temperature? Is it going to rain? Stuff like that. Some of the basic stuff. So whenever you're ordering concrete, say this is an example for slip form paving in, in cold weather, you're going to make sure, you know, if it's 3,028 days, it needs to be air and trained. You know, you may want to add hot water and 2% non-calcium uh, accelerator. You also want to communicate how many yards you need, so 10 yards, and you may need them at like a, a five minute spacing, 10 minute spacing, something like that. It just depends on how quickly you are um, placing concrete and how much you're placing at once. Whenever you're doing for a residential for a house lab, you know, it's not unheard of, 3,000 PSI, you have some chilled water, you need 54 yards and, you know, and you have a 20 minute spacing of trucks, you know, it's not unheard of. But if you, you know, if you don't plan your concrete trucks outright, if you don't plan, uh, if you don't understand the workability of the concrete, if you don't understand the setting time of that mixture, you're going to have a lot of problems um, in the field. So just kind of recognize that. So before you pour the concrete, you're going to always double check the formwork, the rebar spacing, that subgrade. Just make sure you don't want to, you know, all of a sudden realize you got to put in a pipe through a sidewalk, but you don't have a big, you have too big of a pipe, but you don't want to talk about it. So you just throw in what you can and you pour on top of it and you realize you don't have enough of a cover. So you, it cracks. Or maybe you didn't adjust your subgrade right. And now you have an inch and a half concrete and part of it you know cracks off so a mock-up can be really beneficial to helping uh, pour concrete so a mock-up deals with you know your pre-planning the mock-up and then you actually have your placement of that small mock-up then you evaluate how well you did you make adjustments and if you need to do more mock-ups you can't so mock-ups are usually just a small area. Um, it may be just, you know, um, a very, very, very small area, um, you know, whenever on the project and you just want to say, hey, we're going to go over here and we're just going to, you know, do, do 10 yards or, or do a yard or whatever and just see how well, how well this mix design works. Other times you may be, you know, you want to place with, with verticals and you want to place that concrete. And so you'll do some type of vertical uh, placement and it might work out just fine. So you may want to do that vertical placement. Um, you know, it can even be done sometimes. I've seen it in the yard of their, uh, um, whether it's at the ready mix plant or at the construction site. And so they're just testing, you know, it's this very, very small, um, uh, small scaled version. So 
it can really help out when you understand equipment and people's personalities and what they're what they really need for the project and you can kind of make adjustments for the mix design or how how the the people are placing the concrete and, and consolidating it and stuff so when we talk about placing concrete in general it's going to be one nice continuous placement you're going to discharge it as close as possible to that final spot you're going to be consistent between your loads so make sure you're always consistent between, um, between your loads. So you can see here, they're nice and happy placing the concrete. They're at good spaces um, so they can drag that concrete all the way back. So this is just an example of, of, uh, you know, of a placement. So you wanna start in one area and you have your first truck and you want to make sure you pour it in that you know that one nice area so it's going to be one mo nice monolithic pour you're not going to have any cold joints you're going to have your next load be bumped up right against your previous load and you're going to continue pouring that concrete and you're going to finish up your third load usually you want to make sure that um you know each of these loads there's no uh, cold joints that's going to form one nice monolithic placement you want to make sure that you know if how you get it placed is how it's going to be finished how it's going to be solved how it's going to be cured you know, all of it a lot of it depends on your loads <clears throat> so if you look at the start and where you finished at they're at the exact opposite side so make sure you realize that we talk about external consolidation so if you don't have any consolidating of your concrete, maybe it's a five inch slump, you may have internal voids within the concrete. Sometimes they're created from rock, sometimes they're created from your reinforcement, but you might just have some voids, some air pockets. Those, that static air is not strong. So you really wanna go in and consolidate it. So you can use a vibrating plate like you see here, like a, a wet screed truss or wet screed or a screed truss or you can even use an internal vibrator, um, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Usually for floor slabs, you want to use something like an external vibrator on top. Um, use those vibrations in order to move your air. And you want to you want to have that vibration go through the through the entire cross section of that floor slab so that you remove all the air voids, not just most of them. For internal vibrators, like you have for like us. Um, like you can see there, um, for walls and foundations, maybe the edge of, uh, of a floor slab, you may want to use an internal vibrator. You don't want to be throwing this vibrator around, dragging it through the concrete. That is not how you use an internal vibrator. Um, that's why I usually use like wet screeds or screed truss or um, laser screed, stuff like that, so that um, because those are nice, consistent, consolidated, um, how it's, how it's done. Internal vibrators, they need to be in a consistent manner, not just thrown into the wall. Um, they need to be, you know, internal vibrators, especially for walls and for foundations and stuff. If you're going to do more than one lift, you need to make sure that that vibrator penetrates in the previous layer. Uh, a lot of times your lifts, they may be up to four to six feet. As you start getting your list bigger, uh, larger and larger, it's going to get harder and harder to consolidate it properly. So I've even had lifts as small as one foot um, to three foot is commonly what I would do uh, when I was pouring concrete so that I could make sure everything was consolidated adequately. But there are lots of placements with lifts of four, five, six feet that you get placed all the time with no problems, but just be aware the, the, the taller you lift, the more you might have some problems. And how, you know, how, how those vibrators are spaced and stuff are really important. Um, the mixture design and that's in that uh, vibrator, how it's going to, how it's going to vibrate and create that sphere of influence is a big deal. You want to make sure that you know, your, your sphere size and the spacing of it 
um, you, you want to make sure you understand that relationship where it's great if, you know, like this top one, you have, you know, you insert a vibrator, uh, but it doesn't go all the way to the edge. Well, that's not good. You want it to go to all the way to the edge. You also for your, you know, so you can see here, the sphere of influence, maybe you got a stronger vibrator and you went out and you vibrated that concrete and the sphere of influence went all the way out. Sometimes, you know, was uh, like you can see here on this bottom one, maybe your concrete, you know, maybe the sphere of influence, the vibrator, when you start getting it at, you know, 12,500, 13,000 uh, vibrations per minute, you start getting at these really hard hitting uh, vibrator speeds that are real, that are really high up there, can really mess up your concrete, push out the bleed water. So sometimes you really wanna use maybe like a, 8,000 to a 10,000 um, vibrations per minute type um, vibrator. And you may just want to divide out the spacing a little bit. So yeah, you're right. You know, it stinks to, to have to vibrate six times to clear out this area, but you do it in such a way where you actually provide a really good um, monolithic concrete that doesn't have a bunch of air voids in it everywhere by doing that. So you just need to understand that balance between the equipment you have and the mix design that you're using. Um, and that kind of influences the, not only the, the um, you know, that influences the spacing of your vibrator. And sometimes you need to get a better vibrator. Sometimes you just need to realize that that's as good as it's going to get. And you don't need to, you know, try to, try to, try to mess up the, um, the mix because you can over vibrate, um, you can choose the bad vibrator. So you got to be real careful. So good vibration obviously is, looks like this over on the left. Bad vibrations whenever you have a bunch of honeycombing and stuff, um, that's just not any good. Like I said, you don't want to push out bleed water. So when you start seeing forms with water coming out of them, um, when you take those forms off later, they're going to actually have honeycombing and stuff. So that's not good either. So you want to make sure that you properly consolidate that concrete, and then you, and then after you consolidate it, that's whenever you can actually uh, remove that access to level that concrete. So one of the basics is to take a two by four or a strike off plate and knock off that access concrete. You don't want to have it where it's too low anywhere. You want to have it always where it's a little high. Um, that way you can have a nice flat surface because if it's if there's a valley in there, if there's a low spot, um, you can't fill it with, with striking off the plate. Um, so you need to fill it in with some concrete and then re-strike it. So screening, striking, leveling, those can all be kind of used as the same. And this controls a lot of your flat and level, um, you know, specs that you have. It's one of the, one of the many controllers. So there's lots of different leveling techniques. There's a vibrating screed. Here's a bib weld on a bridge deck. Here's a roller. And then here's a laser screed down here. Lots of different leveling techniques. All of them can work for their application. The finishing window is, is really something you need to understand because you have a placement window right here. So until the, the concrete starts, you know, initial set, there's going to be some initial finishing within this placement window, but then you start getting into your finishing window of, do you need to do an intermediate finish like a um, trial finish? And then, you know, your initial, um, your final finish on top of that, do you need to, you know, do a hard, hardened, uh, um, hardened trial finish on top of that? Or is that, you know, you don't, you're not, or maybe you're just doing a, initial finish for a, for a sidewalk, you come in and do your edging and everything with your intermediate finish, and then you do your final where you broom the top of the concrete for that sidewalk. Um, then after you get done with your final finish, then you're gonna have um, um, a sawing window. So after it gets to a certain uh, strength, um, you can saw your concrete. So. We talk about before floating, it's gonna be look kind of like that on top of the concrete. After floating, you can see how there's a lot less voids and depressions and stuff, and it's a lot flatter um, after trialing. So this is only when it's floated, looks may look like that. 
after trialing, it may look like that. So it's a lot tighter um, and denser uh, structure on the very top of that concrete when you trial it. But you need to make sure whenever you trial concrete, you don't want to trial bleed water. You don't want to finish bleed water in general because then you can create a, a, a layer on top of that bleed water that will actually have, delam you can have delamination issues you don't want to um, finish, uh, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to hard trial air and train concrete. That can create holes too. That's actually what that picture on the right is. It's air and train, 6% air and train concrete, um, hard, hard trialed. You really don't, you know, you really want to be careful spraying water on the surface of the concrete. If you can use a finishing aid, that would be better. So you don't get a lot of delamination issues. And you really want to use, do not use a jitterbug, which is a, um, I, I saw a lot in 1970s and 80s, but, you know, every once in a while somebody will pull out a jitterbug, which is um, a piece of tool that in essence pushes the rocks down and brings up the paste, uh, which just really segregates that concrete and you really don't want that. Um, you want to have a you know nice homogeneous concrete mixture so it performs adequately. We also talk about our jointing and our edging. So especially for residential work, um, they'll want um, the edges of that concrete to be nice and smooth and look pretty whenever they take the forms off. So they'll take an edging tool to come in and slightly round the edges. I may take a jointing tool when it's still wet too and create a joint so that drying shrinkage, it won't crack. Um, it'll only crack in that joint. I also talk about um, another type of finishing. So you can have a broom finish or a tined finish. So broom finish a lot of times is for foot traffic, to provide lots of friction. If it's for tining, um, it provides more of not, it provides friction, but it's more for um, road applications and stuff like that, where if you slam on your brakes, the broom finish for friction, um, it'll just remove all that off. This at, um, this tining will, will go into a certain, you know, 16th, eight of an inch in such a way where if you, you know, if you're driving down the road 70 miles an hour, you don't create that nice smooth finish on top. Kind of like if you go and maybe you're in a parking lot whenever you're a teenager and you did some donuts in that parking lot and you go out that you know before before anybody gets the cops called on them or anything or or the owner of the parking lot comes out maybe you went over to um, you got out of your vehicle and just to look at um, the top of that concrete and you can see that it kind of felt like glass. And that is kind of what I'm talking about where that, that's usually a broom finish and it's easy to, for your tires to, um, to knock off that broom finish, you know, because you don't want the drivers that are, you know, preceding you on a road that has a broom finish and you're going 70, you know, you don't want to drive down the road on a really slick finish because um, drivers all the time will slam on their brakes, especially in rush hour traffic. And then you just have a bunch of like, you know, ice on your road, um, you know, in the middle of summer. So that's not, that's not good. So you have that tining to create those marks so that, um, so that you don't have that nice smooth finish. And I am not just, you know, a little side note, I am not suggesting you should go out and try to um, burn, you know, burn, burn rubber, make some donuts in a uh, parking lot. I'm not advocating that whatsoever. Just trying to, trying to liven up the stories a little bit. So we talk about saw joints now. So you, a lot of times you're gonna create, you know, we talked about jointing with, a, with an actual joiner. You can also use a saw joint to create those control joints. Um, which where you take a saw like you see here, this is an early age entry saw, and you, t uh, and you will actually saw roughly one quarter of the depth of the slab. You're gonna saw down. Usually you wanna make sure the spacing, you wanna make sure that, that the saw kind of looks like it's in squares, whatever the saw joints are, 
Concrete likes it when it's in a when it when there's when it's a square. It does not like it whenever the saw joints are rectangular. So a lot of times it'll even crack if it's through a rectangular um, um, you know saw joint. So you want to make sure that whatever you do, um, you know they're in squares. You don't want to have more than a 20 foot section. Uh, I've seen a lot of different people. PCA talks about two times the slab thickness for you know a uh, in, in feet. So if it's a five inch thick slab, they recommend 10 foot spacing for that. For that, I've also seen it where ACI 30, um, 302. Um, I'm on that committee and. Um, slipped my mind for a minute. It, anyways, ACI uh, 302 construction of floor slabs. They recommend, um, in essence, instead of being in feet, two, two to three times the, the slab thickness in feet, they'll do the same thing but in inches. So it's like 24 to 36 um, times the, the, the inches of the floor slab. So they come out to be about the same number. One goes in feet, PCA, ACI does in inches. But for four slabs, especially, that's kind of what they recommend. Um, a lot of pavements and stuff, state DOTs, it's real common to see 10 foot spacing, 15 foot spacings for construction joints. You, you know, the more, the farther you have the spacing, the, the easier it is for those joints to be start cracking in the middle. So you really want to go more than any 20 feet, um, you know, but whenever you start sawing concrete up every one foot or every three foot, it kind of, it can be a real tedious task. So um, a lot of times I'll see eight foot spacing of joints. Um, for a sidewalk, you may see it where it's, you know, where it's every uh, five foot or six foot, something like that. Um, so just kind of be aware. Whenever you're going to make a saw joint, so whenever you're actually going to saw that concrete, you have to hit it within that sawing window. So if that window starts having raveling, that means it's too green and you're sawing it too early. If it has cracks in that joint, um, or it's really hard for your saw to, to saw through that concrete, that means that you're probably sawing it too late. So you want to have a nice, beautiful saw joint like that. And so if you have that, then the chances are you're sawing it within that window. People always ask me, well, how do you know, Dr. Cook, how do you know where that window's at? Well, it's a good question. I think ACI 302 has some guidance. Um, what I always did was if you can make marks within that floor slab, so if you maybe take a little little small nail and you make a very small mark, if you can make a mark with that nail still, then the chances are it's probably still too green or too too you know it's still too weak in strength to handle a saw being cut through it. So you might need to wait a little bit. Um, and then, you know, the time, you know, if you wait more than about 48 hours, there's a pretty good chance you're going to have um, cracks. So you really, you know, that's kind of the window. And I would, and I would highly suggest for um, your application, check with the, with the ACI committee that has the guidelines. Um, they're, they're the experts for the, each of their applications, whether it's pavements or residential or, um, you know, commercial floor slabs each there's there's a committee that 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 um, has some good construction practice guidelines so just be aware of that talk about curing so there's a lot of different ways to cure concrete if it is really hot outside um, then you know your your goal is is you want to you know keep the hydration conditions favorable so if it's really hot outside it's hot weather conditions so high winds and you know, if it's really hot temperature and relatively low humidity, so it's really dry outside, you really need to add lots of water. And so fogging, wet burlap, um, even a curing compound on top can kind of help hold in that moisture and kind of reduce those temperatures so that you don't have as many problems. If it's hot, if it's cold weather, 
um, things like plastic sheets and um, curing blankets, stuff like that could really help out to make sure that you're not going to have, you know, slow down that hydration process. So the curing window, this kind of kind of talks about it. You don't want to cure it too early or you're going to get surface flaws. You don't want to cure it too late because then, you know, if it's hot weather, you may get crazing or, or a plastic shrinkage crack. So there's kind of a window when you want to cure that concrete. Um, if you want to seal concrete, maybe with a saline type um, or silicone acrylic type sealers. Um, if you're doing decorative concrete like you see over here that like my uncle's doing on the right, um, you need to wait at least 28 days before applying that sealer because the alcohols, the pH that's in your concrete, um, they will interact and um, the pH is, is at too high of a level. And so the sealers just can't, can't survive. So um, they will get released in the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, you really need to wait about 28 days. Some DOTs like Oklahoma DOT actually for, they have a silene um, sealer and they actually are, they wait about a year before applying it. Um, for decorative concrete and stuff like that, you may not want to wait a year. You, you might you know, want to wait 28 days, apply it, and you may come back a year later and apply it again, um, would be what I'd recommend. Um, do multiple coats, coatings over a longer period, and it'll help your decorative concrete last a lot longer. What's, what, what, uh, sealing that concrete just creates a barrier. So sometimes it's a barrier so that water doesn't come into it. Sometimes it, it's a barrier so that water can't come in or leave. Um, no impurities can come in there. So it kind of helps with corrosion. A, a silane type sealer is great for that so that you don't have, um, so you don't have issues with corrosion and, and moisture coming into there, but it still allows for that moisture to come out. So with that, have a, have a great rest of your day. Hope you learned something.